Good morning, friends. William Newell back with you again. I don't know about you, but my diary is constantly full. It was full for last week and the week before, and it's full for this week too. Today is Palm Sunday, and this afternoon we were to have had a presidential visit. The president of the Methodist Church in Ireland was due to be the guest speaker at one of my smaller churches, Newton Kelly, in Coal Island. Of course it would have been a grand occasion. The normal congregation of 10 or 12 would have been swelled eightfold. A choir was booked to sing and then afterwards there would have been an, a, an absolute feast. Endless cups of tea and all good things. The president would have been shaking hands with everyone. But of course, that and everything else in my diary has been cancelled due to circumstances beyond our control. And we're all in the same boat. There were just so many things that we were looking forward to this Easter, but which are now, well, they're, they're not going to happen. But you know, there was one event in history which I am so glad wasn't cancelled. It's the event we commemorate on this day, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now this was no ordinary occasion. This was no ordinary day. And this was no ordinary journey. Let me read you the story as we find it in Mark chapter 11. It says, When they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever set. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and he'll send it back immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing, standing near said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks in it, and he sat on it, and many threw their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You know, friends, for Jesus, Jerusalem was a place of danger. And here he was, going into the one place where his life was most at risk, Jerusalem. If there was one place that you weren't welcome, or where people didn't want you, you would avoid going there, particularly if people were after your blood. You would stay well clear, if you had any sense at all. And yet Jesus deliberately went into the one place where his life was most in danger. Now I want to break from that for a moment because today in our world there is danger all around us. The danger of infection, the danger of the virus and there is fear. And just now I want to applaud all the frontline st staff, those who continually go into places of danger to care for those who are in our hospitals. We applaud them as they put themselves into danger. And we thank God for them. Jesus went deliberately into the one place where his life was most in danger, Jerusalem. Not everyone liked Jesus, you see. Certainly the majority of people did. He healed the sick. He brought good news. He loved everyone. He went about doing good. I'm sure he was popular with a lot of people, but not with everyone. The authorities hated him. They'd sworn to do away with him. And you know, if I had been him, the last place on earth that I would have gone would have been Jerusalem. It was the most hostile place in the world as far as Jesus was concerned. But he didn't stumble into it by accident, nor did he slip in under the cover of darkness and hide. No, he made a very public entrance. Crowds lined the streets. They waved palm branches. They cried, Hosanna. 
Maybe some watched him ride into Jerusalem and thought to themselves, does he know what he's letting himself in for? Does he realise the hostility there is against him? Does he not realise that the, the, the religious leaders are just baying for his blood? Oh, he understood that all right. He knew exactly what was ahead of him. But he knew the end of the story. He didn't cancel it out of his diary. Although he did pray to his heavenly father. Father, if there's any other way. But there was no other way. In his mind's eye he could see the crown of thorns. In a few days this raver, razor sharp plait would be battered into his brow. The scourging whip was already sitting ready. The cross was looming. You know, friends, the brutality of the cross, it was beyond words. Of all the means of putting people to death, the cross was reckoned to be the most cruel. Jesus knew exactly what was, a, what was ahead of him, and yet he willingly went to Jerusalem. He knew the end of the story, but why did he do it? He did it because he loved you and me. His shed blood was the only way that we could be redeemed. Oh, he didn't have to go to Jerusalem that day, but he chose to. He could have avoided the authorities. He could have called 10,000 angels to whisk him back to heaven. But where would that have left you and me? It was God's plan for him to go to Jerusalem to be crucified, that he would die instead of us, and that all we would have to do would be accept him as our saviour and Lord and acknowledge that there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves except repent of our sins and believe in him, that his death gives us life. The Bible says, without this shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins and we are sinners. Jesus headed into Jerusalem on that, on that first Palm Sunday for one purpose, that you and I might be redeemed. But that leaves us with a question. How will you respond to his love for you? Will you receive him and follow him and be redeemed? Or will you reject him and perish? You know, Isaac Watts, the well-known hymn writer, he outlines our responsibility in the last lines of one of his greatest hymns. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Friends, will we not want to give our lives to him who did so much for us? I'll be back with you tonight at seven o'clock. See you then. Bye. God bless.